Okay, so we actually need one more condition, uh, and it's to prevent people from doing something tricky. So, you know, in, in our model so far, we've said we're going to allow households to decide their, their savings rate each period. So households can, up till now, be very tricky. What they can do is have a very high level of consumption funded by borrowing, and then next period, when they have to repay their debt, they can just borrow more to repay their debt and then borrow even more to, to fund a high level of consumption. And they can just keep doing that indefinitely with their debt level just increasing exponentially forever. Okay, there's nothing to stop households from doing that yet. So we have to impose this condition called the no Ponzi condition. And the idea is you can't just keep borrowing to pay off your debt forever. Okay. Um, and formally, we're going to write that this way. And I'll explain to you what this means, but more or less it means what I just said, which is that eventually you have to pay back your debt. You can't grow your debt level forever to fund consumption. So how can we sort of understand this uh, mess of notation? If you look at little k s, you can see that we have this little e to the power n plus g times s here. So in a sense, what this is really is just saying big K of s, okay? Because um, the denominator of little k of s, which is the amount of uh, workers in the economy and the human capital level, or the uh, amount of education, if you like, like, right? So let me just write this. You can see what I'm talking about. Uh, maybe I should do it this way. Little k of s is equal to big K of s divided by a s l s. Okay. So the denominator here is growing at this rate. So in a sense here, what we're doing is we're taking away the growth of the denominator. So you can really think of this expression, this part of it, as just being big K of s. That's like the amount of capital, or really so far, the amount of savings in the household. Okay, so there's a very close link here, as I mentioned earlier, between capital and savings. In fact, I guess for this slide, it's important to mention that we want to think about it here as savings, since it can be negative. Households can borrow, right? So this could be negative. The household doesn't care about any sort of resource constraints or anything like that. Of course, we're going to impose that. Um, but for now, the households don't care. So they could, um, they could have negative levels of savings. So this thing could be negative. Okay, and then here we're going to kind of discount the value of the savings to period zero. So what we're saying is that um, this is kind of, yeah, this is like the, if I'm sitting at period zero and I'm thinking about what's happening at time S, that's kind of the amount of capital or the value of the capital at time S from the perspective of someone at time zero, okay? So what we're not allowing them to do is to let the debt level, like let the value of the savings, I said capital just now, I should have said savings, um, let the value of savings get very, very, very low and stay there forever. Okay, you can't borrow and then just keep debt forever and never pay it back. Eventually, you have to pay back your debt. Okay, that's the idea. So I'm not sure if that, you know, it's still a lot of notation, it's still, um, uh, it's still kind of a complicated expression. What I want you to remember is just the meaning, which is that we don't allow you to roll over your debt forever. Eventually you have to pay it back. Okay, we're gonna impose that on households. You can think of it as another constraint on household decisions. You know, they have a budget constraint and then they also have this no Ponzi constraint. Okay, so up until now we've had a very general utility function. Now let's make uh, let's talk about a specific utility function that's going to allow us to solve this uh, solve uh, in greater detail um, the equilibrium, uh, equilibrium for excuse me the steady state equilibrium for this economy. Okay, so this is called the constant relative risk aversion utility function, and it's very common in macroeconomics, simply because you can see it's quite easy to work with. It's just consumption to some power. Okay, um, it turns out that in this setup, 
uh, 1 divided by theta is going to be our measure of the intertemporal elasticity of substitution. So what that means is kind of how indifferent people are between uh, consumption today and tomorrow. If, uh, if 1 divided by theta is very large, meaning that there's a very high elasticity of substitution, then I don't really care about um, smoothing my consumption. I just want to, uh, you know, I'm okay having lots of consumption one period and then very little consumption the next period if that gives me more total consumption. Um, that's how I, I would read this. Okay. Um, on the other hand, suppose that one divided by theta is very low or theta is very high. Um, that would mean that uh, I don't care what the price is, the interest rate, if you like, is. I want to have the same uh, amount of spending in, or the same amount of consumption in each period. Okay, and this is, and you can maybe tell by the way I'm describing these, uh, this intertemporal elasticity of substitution, that there's a close relationship here with this substitution effect versus income effect. So um, I'm not sure if I have any more anything else to say about this on a further slide, but if you have a low intertemporal elasticity of substitution or a high theta, then um, the income effect typically will dominate. Whereas if you have a high intertemporal elasticity of substitution, the substitution effect will dominate. Okay. So um, yeah. Now. Uh, there's a special case which we'll use later in the course, although not today, I don't think, which is you can see if theta is equal to one, something funny happens since, uh, since we're going to get ct to the power one, and then down here we're going to get zero in the denominator. So it's the, something weird is happening. Uh, it turns out that as theta approaches one, um, the utility function approaches this log utility. Okay, so one way to think about this utility function is sort of as a log type utility function. Okay. You know, the one feature of the log function, one important feature, I'll say utility. So one important feature of the log function is that um, it grows very slowly. Okay, so uh, when CT becomes large, then the marginal uh, utility from additional consumption is very small. So you may know that uh, there's a series, you, you might know this. So uh, if you have one plus one half plus one third plus one fourth plus one fifth um, plus dot dot dot, this is a famous series. I can't remember the name of it, uh, but um, you can see that this series, uh, you know, it's growing very slowly. So eventually, say, when we get out to the hundredth term, we're only adding one divided by 100. You know, we're adding very little to the sum of, of, uh, of the series. When we get out to the millionth term, we're only adding one divided by one million to the series. But the interesting thing about this series is that it diverges, so meaning it gets arbitrarily large if you add enough terms in the series up. So, um, so even though, I mean, it's a surprising, to me this was also a very surprising sort of mathematical fact, um, that this series will eventually hit every number. It'll eventually hit 10 million. It'll eventually hit 10 million million. But I mean, you know, by the hundredth term, we're only adding one divided by 100 with each term. So the number of terms we have to add to get to these huge numbers is astronomical. Okay, why am I talking about that? This sum is actually very closely related to the log function. So, uh, you know, once I get out to log of 100, then you may know that the derivative of log of 100, well, let's say, let's say it's log of x, so the derivative of log x is one divided by x, mm -hmm. derivative with respect to x. So it means that sort of the marginal increase in, uh, in utility when consumption is 100, whatever that means, is just one divided by 100. So you can see that it's very closely related to this, um, this series. And in fact, the, um, there's, 
there's like a number, I believe called Euler's number, um, which is the difference between this series and log, you know, the difference converges to some constant actually when, when, um, when you go very far out here in the series and, and go very far up on the log function. So anyway, that's all. Log is a function that increases very slowly. So we get a very quickly decreasing marginal utility. Okay, so we want to put the utility function. You see we've got a CT here, that's consumption per person. Because we've written the budget constraint and we're gonna be dealing mostly in this model with uh, per effective labor or per unit of human capital terms, let's do the same with the utility function. That's gonna be relatively easy. You recall that we've defined little ct as big ct divided by a. So we can substitute out big ct with this expression, which is the education level times consumption per unit of human capital. All right. Um, we've made an assumption already about how a, a of t grows. So a of t is just a of zero times e to the power of gt, okay? Uh, so we can substitute that in. And then finally, let's take it and put it down. We haven't really done anything here, I guess, but let's just uh, take these two terms and put them, take them away outside of the fraction and we end up with this term. So then we kind of have a constant, if you like, not a constant, I should say, uh, this here is a constant. This here is something that grows exogenously with rate one minus theta times G. And then we have this expression, which has to do with consumption per unit of human capital. Okay. Now, actually, I think I'm going to do this in the next video.